well <laughs> uh let us get started uh, with today's topic so so far what we have been doing is to understand how electron correlation effects give rise to uh, effective spin spin interactions that's how we derived um, this or at least motivated uh, the heisenberg spin hamiltonian and then looked at its ground states and excitations and so on so uh, the focus of those lectures was on demonstrating and understanding that magnetism is an emergent phenomenon there is no fundamental force or interaction in nature uh, which sort of gives you magnetism it's an emergent phenomenon because of you know complex electron correlation effects coupled with of course uh, when it comes to solids the crystal structure Uh, although we haven't gone into those details so uh, although I, i did talk about ferromagnetic interactions and antiferromagnetic interactions meaning uh, interactions that tend to make uh, interacting spins parallel to each other or anti parallel to each other uh, more precisely maximize the total spin or you know make the total spin zero as a ferromagnetic and antiferromagnetic interactions without actually really defining what a ferromagnet or an antiferromagnetic material is so those are the types of questions that we will try to address in today's lecture uh and in the process we'll discover that magnetic behavior of materials or magnetic response of materials uh, in a way uh, is very rich and diverse and it goes much beyond the binary classification of ferromagnets and antiferromagnets uh, so most part of it will uh, cover in today's lecture and there may be some more which we'll get back to in subsequent lectures okay so uh, one of the quantities we defined very early in this so this was defined as magnetization the magnetic moment per if you normalize it to volume then magnetize magnetic moment per volume uh from the context we'll understand whether we have uh, normalized or not and h is the external field external magnetic field so we apply a field change the field and you measure how the magnetization of the system changes so what you are essentially looking at here is the response of the system to change in the external magnetic field so it's a response function uh there are several other response functions that one can measure for example when you anyway let's not digress so here what what we are sort of talking about is a response of the system to an external perturbation and based on this response 
uh, we can have several types of materials as far as their magnetic properties are concerned. And of course, the response of the system is dependent on what the magnetic structure is, how the moments inside the material are arranged, uh, how they interact with each other, whether they interact with each other at all or not. Uh, and of course, it depends on temperature and so on. So these are some of the things that we will try to understand. And so the classification that of materials that I'm going to talk about now is based on this magnetic response. So uh, let me just list out first. Okay, so we can have diamagnetism, paramagnetism, ferromagnetism, antiferromagnetism, ferrimagnetism, and we will realize, I'll not talk about this today, that this sort of ferromagnetism, antiferromagnetism, etc., etc., I mean, these are not, these are sort of special cases, at least these two are special cases of what we can generally define as spin density wave. The name should give you some idea of what one is talking about. There is a spin density. One can talk about spin density in space. So given a point R inside the material, at any point R, the spin density is um, one can define spin density like this. The density of upspin up spin electrons minus the density of downspin electrons, which tells you what is the net spin density in that, at that point. So, uh, and when one talks about wave of spin density, you realize that the spin density varies in some manner in space. And uh, so, Ferromagnets and antiferromagnets are special cases of those. So I'll just briefly touch upon this uh, in in uh, in a later lecture, maybe the next lecture. So today we'll uh, try to understand these things as they are written here. So what is a diamagnet? A diamagnetism is a phenomenon in which, in talking in terms of this susceptibility, the susceptibility is weak small. So which means that um, the material reacts very weakly to changing external magnetic field. And one sometimes in order to compare material, one sometimes, you know, gives these numbers in terms of chi over mu naught, where mu naught is the permeability of free space. Um, that is called relative susceptibility. So this is very small. This is very small, uh, something of the order of 10 to the minus five. But the it's most inter, uh, I mean, the in, 
most important point is that it is negative. So chi in a diamagnet is less than zero. So what does that tell you? Uh, when you apply a magnetic field, the response of the system is, is such that to create a field which is opposed to the external field. So it tries to uh, negate the external field. And so chi is negative. In other words, it tries to shield the external field. So that's what diamagnet, most diamagnets, you know, have uh, chi very small, except, except. So this is generally true, except for superconductors. And superconductors is something we'll briefly discuss. I mean, that will be, in fact, after we finish our discussion on magnetism, we'll touch upon superconductors. And that will be the last topic in this course. So superconductors, um, leaving out uh, some details, um, which we'll uh, see uh, later in the, in the lecture. So chi is minus one, or chi bar is minus one, I think. So the point is that a perfect superconductor, I mean a superconductor, not a perfect superconductor, a superconductor creates a field which completely shields out the external field. So that the field inside, the effective magnetic field inside the, the material is zero. So this is called, and this is the reason it is called a perfect diamagnet. A superconductor is a perfect diamagnet. In fact, that's an essential hallmark of a superconductor. Just having the resistance going to zero is, is not what you call superconductivity, but it has to be a perfect diamagnet and which goes by the name of Meissner effect. Okay, so that's about diamagnets. Weak response, uh, opposing the external field. Superconductors uh, show strong response, completely uh, screens out the external field, and it's a perfect diamagnet. So that's diamagnet. So let us now look at paramagnet. Consider a system in which you have uh, moments. So there are magnetic moments in the system. Let's not worry about where it comes from. Most of the time it's from electron spin. Sometimes you also have orbital moments. But orbital moments are more tricky in the sense that whether orbital moments are there or not there in the system depends on various things, including the crystal environment of the magnetic species that gives rise to the moment, the crystal structure, you know, in particular, the point group symmetry around the magnetic atom in the system, uh, in, the, in the crystal. So there are a lot of details on which um, the existence of an orbital moment depends. In particular, in cubic symmetry, I mean, systems with cubic symmetry, the orbital moment is almost non-existent. And that phenomenon is called, so if the orbital moment vanishes in a crystal, I mean, if you, for example, take a 3D transition metal atom, okay? In, a, in an isolated atom, of course, you will have orbital moment. Uh, in general, except uh, 
if the filling of the d orbitals is such that the orbital moment happens to be zero. In general, there is a finite orbital moment, but when you put that uh, in a crystal which has cubic symmetry, most often you find that the orbital moment is, is zero. And that phenomenon is called the quenching. Just to make you familiar with the term, Uh, the, the orbital moment is said to be quenched, but we won't get into discussions of this. For us, there are some moments in the system, but there are no interactions between them. So the exchange that we were talking about, that exchange is negligibly small in, in this system. So in this case, in case of no interactions or weak interactions when they can be neglected, what you can do is, is basically you have a collection of independent magnetic moments. And now when you apply a magnetic field, each moment reacts independently to that field. And uh, so basically, if you are asked to calculate thermal averages, let's say the average magnetic moment, all you have to do is to do the statistical mechanics of a collection of independent uh, moments. So that is rather straightforward to do. I'll, of course, not do all the algebra. I'll just uh, indicate what you have to do. So suppose I have applied a magnetic field. Could be any direction. Let's call that z direction. So H is pointing in this direction. And I have these moments, so each moment is mu. And at temperature T, I want to calculate the average uh, moment along the field direction. So if I have to do that, I have to find, so what is the interaction energy of this moment? with the field, it's minus, of course, this is a vector, which is so now, uh, what, what is the sort of, in this theta phi space, now the moments are fixed, uh, The moments are fixed, so all that can happen is that the angle between the moment and the magnetic field can change. And because the magnetic field is along z direction, there is a complete symmetry with respect to phi. So the sort of phase space volume between theta and, sorry, this is theta, and this is d theta, between theta and theta plus d theta would be sine theta d theta, there is a twice pi coming from the phi integral. So the average, uh, okay, and, and this is the energy. So uh, what we want to do calculate is the moment along the field direction. So that would be given by um, e to the minus, so this would make it plus. There's a mu, and you have another cos theta coming because if the moment is pointing along theta, its projection along uh, H will bring in another cos theta. Uh, sorry, sine theta, cos theta, and twice pi's will cancel out. So this will be theta h theta sine theta d theta theta integrated from zero to pi. So 
this will be average mu along the field direction or along the z direction. So this is what you have to evaluate. And um, all right. So again, as I said, I won't get into the evaluation of it. Just let me make sure that I have written all the factors correctly. Uh, so this is for one moment, one of the magnetic moment. And when I have a collection of N, capital N of them, I'll simply multiply this by one because each one of them is behaving independently. So when you uh, carry this through, what I, I'll just write down the final result. You may already be familiar with this. So let me write it here. the magnetization along H of course, uh, this is given by capital M is the total number of moments you have in the system, mu is value of each moment. Bolic. Have you ever seen this function before? Oyon, did you come across this function before? Yeah. Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. This has, huh, yes. So this has a name. It's called the Lajma function. And what, uh, let's look at some limits of these. So now I'll erase this. So we'll call this alpha, where alpha is mu h over kBt. So in case of weak field or, or essentially the limit uh, when alpha is much less than one, which means mu h is much less than kBt. Uh, one can expand this. So L alpha is alpha by three minus alpha cubed by something, I think, whatever. So that's the expansion of the Langevin function. So if I take the leading term only, I get so the leading order. I'll take this term only. where alpha is of course mu h over kBT. So now uh, what am I trying to calculate? I'm trying to calculate this um, susceptibility. So del M del H So what does that tell me? That the susceptibility, so this is chi, chi goes as one over T. 
So when you have independent moments, not interacting with each other, uh, their temperature dependence of the susceptibility uh, is, is one over T to leading order. Now, uh, here what we have assumed is that the moments behave as sort of classical objects so that they can uh, orient along any angle theta. Um, theta can be continuous, but most often, I mean, these moments are quantum objects, so they cannot orient along any direction. There are, if, you know, so basically if this moment is characterized by the angular momentum J, and, angular momentum quantum number j if it's a pure spin moment then of course it's the s one is talking about if it's the orbital moment it's the l quantum number one is talking about it can be a combination of spin and um, orbital moment so that's why i write uh, j so the statistical mechanics that one has to do will be slightly different so basically then one has to evaluate um, H where uh, mu z is j z. Um, wait a minute. So yeah, I wrote it slightly differently in my notes. So let me um, just define this by um, mu z. Okay, so I, I won't specify this. So basically this and this mu z is proportional to j z depending on how it comes about. So you could have factors of g mu b, for example, here. If one is talking about spin moments, where g is two for spin moments, if it's orbital moment, G is one, or if it's a combination, then G is the, you know, uh, G factor that you have to can calculate when you combine uh, L and S. So that's the general uh, expression. Um, okay, and basically if you uh, sort of again sum this, then uh, you get what is called the Brillouin function. <coughs> Right, so this is the Brillouin function, and uh, uh, again, um, alpha has the same definition. And if you sort of take the lowest order expansion and calculate the chi, this is what you'll get. So from this, chi is
So this is exactly uh, a similar uh, expression like this in mu squared. Here I have in g squared j j plus one k mu b squared. So uh, you know this is obviously the the eigen the eigenvalue for j squared operator. So so one can here define an effective moment to be g root over j j plus one mu b. And in terms of this effective moment, this expression is exactly the same as this expression. And the most important part is that the temperature dependence of chi is inverse. So chi goes as one over t. So uh, irrespective of whether you treat the moment classically or uh, quantum mechanically, you get the same behavior of chi as a function of t, but it's inversely proportional to temperature. There are there are uh, paramagnets and there are then there are paramagnets. I mean these paramagnets that we are talking about, uh, these are systems that have magnetic moments, but then they don't interact with each other. We could have systems in which the electron we we don't have and and the best way of thinking of the other kind of paramagnets is that. Uh, you have banned electrons, uh, but the states are such that the up the upspin electron bands and downspin electron bands are exactly have exactly the same energy, so that the spin density is zero everywhere. So these are called so whenever you have electrons in bands, these are called itinerant electrons. So let us get familiar with the term because. We'll come back to magnetism in itinerant electron systems in the next lecture. So one is talking about itinerant electrons. That are in bands. And they are delocalized. And you have a system where this uh, row up minus row down is zero everywhere. Such systems have, we'll see this later. I mean, I won't, uh, I can't get into the discussion of where it comes about right now. But if you can, if you ask what is the susceptibility of such systems, it turns out that chi for these kind of systems is simply, apart from some numbers over here, is the density of states. Um, what symbol should I use? Uh, this is density. So let me use the old symbol G. So this is the density of states. And e epsilon f is the Fermi energy. So, so this chi is simply proportional to the density of states at the Fermi energy, and it has no temperature dependence. Okay. So these kind of paramagnets, these are also paramagnets, they are called Pauli paramagnets. Uh, 
and you know metals like butyric alkali metals or things like aluminum and so on um these are all paramagnets pauli paramagnets all right so we have learned about diamagnets so i'll come back to diamagnets once again towards the end so we have learned about diamagnets paramagnets and other paramagnets and then let us come to ferromagnets so now we'll be talking about ferromagnets so what are ferromagnets these are of course the types of magnetic materials that uh, man sort of discovered first because of their uh, ability to attract other magnetic substances like iron and so on so in this um basically what happens is that there is a finite magnetization even in absence of an external field so that so the systems we talked about diamagnets paramagnets paramagnets although they have magnetic moments but if you don't apply a magnetic field they don't order i mean there is no finite magnetization in absence of an external field when you apply an external field those moments try to align along the field direction and that gives you some magnetization but ferromagnets are materials which show finite magnetization even in absence of uh, magnetic field so this is called spontaneous magnetization so a phenomenological theory of ferromagnetism was given by wise more than more than 100 years ago in light of what we did for the paramagnetic systems it's worth uh, sort of quickly going over that it's the same kind of analysis uh, i mean how you calculate the magnetization in that that idea is exactly the same except that now in i mean in addition to the external magnetic field so you have an external magnetic field but in addition you have the the assumption was that the moments in the system experience another field because of all the other moments so in a sense it's a mean field theory so in addition to the external field there is something that why is called a molecular field and which he um, so this is h and this is the molecular field which is proportional to the magnetization so the effective field that a moment experiences now is h plus so that we and the analysis we did for the paramagnet is now uh, to be repeated in pre uh, in presence of this effective field okay so the thermal average that we calculated is now to be done in presence of this effective field but remember finally when we calculate susceptibility for that we have to take the derivatives with respect to the external field not the effective field so how does it go um i don't have to sort of repeat the arguments as to how you calculate the averages that it remains exactly the same so the the after you calculate the thermal average what you get is the magnetization <coughs> treating it classically you get this when now alpha involves uh, earlier it just involved mu h 
by kt now it will be mu h effective over kt and so from this we can write the magnetization as um kt over just a minute w mu minus Uh, each over W. Okay, so now what, what has to happen is that uh, whatever solutions we get, uh, this uh, these have to be all these have to be satisfied so earlier alpha did not involve a magnetization right in the case of paramagnets there was no m in the relation for alpha so alpha uh, just depended on the external field or the temperature but here alpha depends on m, m depends on alpha. So whatever relation, uh, whatever solution you get from here has to satisfy this as well. I mean, this you get from this. So, so these two has, both of these have to be satisfied. And that is usually done, uh, I mean, one can see this graphically. So you are plotting alpha here, you are plotting, um, these two functions, these are this, and I'll just, you know, roughly do it. So you are plotting M from two different relations. Let us call this A, let us call this B. Um, the A looks like something like this. The B looks like something like this. This is straight line. And this is the this is the straight line. This when h is zero, and wh why are we uh, drawing it for h equal to zero? Because we are trying to look at solutions spontaneous magnetization. Whether there are solutions with spontaneous magnetization, and in fact, it turns out that this is the point at which this is the value of alpha for which. Uh, this and this, both these are satisfied for h equal to zero. So that's the point with uh, spontaneous magnetization. So that will give you value of the magnetization. Now let us look at what happens as you change the temperature. As you change, so let us look at the extreme case when t is equal to zero. When t is equal to zero, the slope of this line B is of course zero. So, you will have something like this. In other words, what one is trying to say is that the this point of intersection will be far to the right at which the the Lajeva function um, levels off. So the magnetization cannot increase beyond that. So what you have at t equal to zero is the saturation magnetization, which will be it, it in fact goes to one. So saturation magnetization. Uh, 
sorry n mu okay now as you start decreasing the temperature uh, the slope uh, increases uh, as you in try start increasing the temperature from zero the slope uh, increases this gives you the slope so uh, you know the point at which the intersection happens will move down so the magnetization comes down and then we will reach a point where this slope slope of this straight line b and the initial slope of this curve given by the large bar function they are exactly the same so basically this straight line becomes the tangent to this curve at the origin so when that happens the only solution you have is uh, so let's say this happens at some t equal to tc so at this temperature and higher the only solution that you have is with magnetization equal to zero so t greater than tc so magnetization is zero and this tc is called the curie temperature okay so you get an idea about the curie temperature uh now what we try to do is to estimate it based on these quantities can we estimate this well what you have to do is then uh, take the derivative of this uh you know this curve at alpha equal to 0 uh, equate that to the slope of this line and the match just exactly at tc so that will give you a value of tc so if you do that So basically, uh, you have to take the derivative of the large bar function, and it turns out, uh, skipping the algebra, this. And from this straight line, from this is from A, and del alpha is. is from b so now you have to equate these two because they have to this is for any alpha and also at alpha equal to zero so when you equate you get and, and when exact when uh, at what temperature do they become equal it's a tc so when you equate these two from this you get a value of tc so this gives you tc is uh, w mu squared Okay, so in terms of this coefficient of the molecular field, so the only unknown here is, is this W. Uh, you get an expression for T. Good. Um, you can do the exercise when you consider the moments to be quantum. It will come out in terms of J that I have indicated in my notes. You can check that. Let's not uh, spend time on that. Now, uh, finally, we want to calculate the susceptibility. Okay. So, So from the expression for uh, M that we had written as expression A, I'll write this as, so it will be del L del H, 
uh, it's easier to write del l del alpha del alpha del h and you can evaluate del alpha del h to be So I, I'll take this, put this in here, so that I am uh, removing del alpha del h, eliminating del alpha del h, and from that you can uh, basically get an expression for chi, which will be. So this part I leave for you to work out. In terms of the, this is alpha derivative of l. This this thing. So chi is a function of temperature. Temperature comes in the denominator, as in the case of paramagnets, but then it is T minus something, T minus. 3TCL primed alpha. So it also depends on alpha. Okay. And the interesting uh, thing to check is suppose I'm coming down from the uh, high temperature side, all right? No, what I'm saying is, yeah, so basically suppose I'm, I'm looking at this point or uh, T greater than that. Okay. So the screen um, share. Oh, I don't know why it's, it is stopping. Yeah, so what we were saying is that um, at t equal to tc or, or in that uh, for those values of t, uh, you see this del m del alpha is mu n by 3. So basically that comes from the fact that del l del alpha is one third. So at these temperatures, del this alpha prime is one third. So now if you uh, put that in, so t at uh delta del tc uh for such values l alpha prime is one third and then at those values chi so if you just plug in that value you'll get in So uh, for the paramagnets, you are getting one over T. Here you are getting basically same thing, but T minus TC. And the T minus TC tells you that as you come down from the high temperature side or even low temperature side, 
So as T approaches Tc, the susceptibility blows up. So what does it mean? It's, we, we just said right in the beginning that susceptibility is the response of the system to an external perturbation. So when that response function diverges, that means that um, there is some instability in the system. And that instability is the magnetic instability, the ferromagnetic instability. So if you are coming down from the high temperature side, the pins are disordered because we saw that in such cases, the only solution is when the uh, total magnetization is zero. So there are moments in the system, but they are arranged randomly because of thermal fluctuations so that there is no net magnetization, the sum up to zero. But as you reach TC, um, this instability sets in. So at TC and, and lower temperatures, you start getting uh, solutions with finite magnetization. There is a net uh, alignment of spins along the field direction. So that is what shows up here. And in general, I mean, take this message from here. In general, divergence of response functions are taken as indications of instabilities in systems. So there is some, you know, change happening in the organization of uh, whatever this response function measures uh, of those things inside the system. In fact, we'll come to this idea of divergence of susceptibility in the next, ne next lecture also. So if one plots chi as a function of temperature for the ferromagnet, this is what it looks like. And of course, these are measured in experiments. So, Something like that. Yeah, I have um, just, just let me correct that just a bit. This is TC and this is chi. So that's how it looks like. So there is a divergence and there is a character, characteristic divergence, how, you know, not just the susceptibility, various things diverge as T approaches TC. And these are part of, you know, one understands such things in terms of the theory of a second order phase transition, the critical behavior and so on and so forth which is of course beyond, beyond what oh, we want to discuss here. Okay, so that's, uh, that's a ferromagnet and this law, this one over T minus TC behavior is called a Curie wise law. So the important things that you uh, keep in mind is that um, the susceptibility diverges at t equal to tc from both sides and the behavior of chi uh, beyond t tc is one by t minus tc. So that is ferromagnet. Finally, we come to antiferromagnet. <clears throat> In, this, in these systems, there are equal number of up and down spin moments. So, you know, a, a sort of classical picture would be there are as many up moments as there are down moments. So the net moment magnetization is zero. 
There is no net, net magnetization in an antiferromagnet. Um, so therefore, um, magnetization is not an indicator of what the magnetic order is in such systems. And how do they behave? The, the relative susceptibility in such systems is also small, typically. You know, this is Uh, maybe a little more than the diamagnets, but still small. I mean, there's nothing like a diverging susceptibility of a ferromagnet. Uh, in, okay, so let's leave it that. So what I want to talk about here is that, um, okay, what do you expect if you apply I mean, if you measure susceptibility of an antiferromagnet as a function of temperature. So I'll just give you that slot. I'll not go through the similar kind of analysis that we did for the ferromagnet, simply because again, there are two sublattices. The ideas are same, but uh, the algebra is a little bit lengthier. So let's, um, let's just look at the essential ideas and uh, slot chi as a function of temperature. So uh, one thing to notice is that, so uh, again, we have a two sub lattice structure. So in the ferromagnet, we talk, talked about one type of molecular field. Here we have to talk about two types of molecular field, the intra sub lattice. Because if I have broken my system, divided my system into two sublattices A and B, where A sublattice sites uh, are occupied by major, I mean, uh, they have up moments and the B sublattice sites have down moments, then intra sublattice sites, the molecular field, so the moments on sublattice A, when they influence a particular moment on a sublattice site A, their effect is like to align it ferromagnetically. So intra sublattice um, molecular fields would be ferromagnetic, whereas A and B are coupled antiferromagnetically. So inter sublattice fields are antiferromagnetic. So I use the notations omega 1 and omega uh, w1 w2 for these so just keep this in mind as i said i won't do the algebra here i won't discuss this in detail uh, but let us try to see what to expect uh, when we apply a magnetic field to this system. So suppose you have an ordered antiferromagnetic state. So the moments are ordered this way in the system. Suppose you are at t equal to zero. So the moments are perfectly ordered. Now you apply a magnetic field along the field direction. So now it matters in which direction you are applying the field. Uh, if you apply the field along the uh, along the spin axis, I mean the moment axis, uh, what happens is that there is no torque on these moments. So they don't try to do anything. Okay, so there's nothing really that happens. And so the susceptibility will be zero. There's no response. But as the temperature increases, there's a little bit of thermal fluctuations, okay? And then when you apply the field, the, the spins, which are not strictly aligned along the direction, will try to align along the field direction. So there is some response of the system. So the susceptibility starts increasing. So it starts increasing from C equal to zero. Uh, let's see. 
So it starts increasing from t equal to zero. Take that shape of it. Yeah, in fact, it goes like that. And it, it, it goes to a maximum at, at some temperature. Um, but this is the temperature at which the order is completely lost. So when the order is completely lost, uh, well, it didn't matter. It doesn't matter whether you are in a ferromagnetic phase or anti-ferromagnetic phase before that. So the behavior after that is, you know, one over T minus something. Okay, um, so so this is the temperature at which the um, at which the transition takes place. And what we are plotting here is chi parallel, where the, the magnetic field is applied parallel to the, uh, the the moment axis. One could also apply the field in this direction. So this is one situation, but I can have also apply the field in this direction. So. One thing is easy to see that when you apply a field in the perpendicular direction, there will be torque on moments on, on both the sublattices. So they will try to do something. They will try to align, uh, make some attempt to align with the field. So there will be a positive chi. A further detailed argument shows that in fact, this is temperature independent, but uh, again, let's not worry about that. So this is chi perpendicular, and beyond this, it decreases. So this is the behavior. So there's a marked difference in the, and, and you have a sort of peak. So a simple argument would give you this. When you measure, you get slightly different looking curves, but um, this is the essential idea. This temperature is where the Transition from anti, the ordered antiferromagnetic phase to a disordered phase, which is also called the paramagnetic phase, takes place is called the nail temperature. Remember, when discussing the Heisenberg model, I talked about this classically ordered state as the nail state. This is, you know, the same name. This temperature is called the nail temperature. So what are the various quantities in terms of the molecular field? Nail temperature turns out to be, I, as I said, I won't get to the detailed derivation of this. The susceptibility A, a new quantity comes in Ta, where this Ta is
and for t less than tn So well, let's not write that because this argument is it's not exactly what you get here. So let's just stick with that. Um, I mean, this analysis will give you some expression for t uh, for chi below t n. But the but the important point is that uh, there is a dis there there are distinctly different behavior of chi whether depending on whether you apply the field perpendicular to the moment direction or parallel to the moment direction. I mean, in measurements, you don't get exactly this kind of a straight line, but nevertheless, that's the simple argument. Okay, so that's an antiferromagnet. Um, let me now tell you what a ferrimagnet is. In order for you to get a ferrimagnet, the, all the magnetic ions in the system cannot be the same. Then you get do not get a ferrimagnet. If you have two different types of ions, or a, you know <coughs> ions that are at least symmetry-wise different, then uh, in some cases you can have a situation where Suppose you have alternate sides, which are not equivalent, okay? They are not the same lattice sides. Uh, so uh, I, I call them A and B as usual. And so on. And I have, the system is such that there is a moment here, there is a moment here which is uh, oriented opposite, but the values are different. So this is a B, small moment, A, a large moment, B, small moment, A, large moment, and so on. So you have alternate uh, sites of moments that are oriented opposite to each other, but their magnitudes are not the same. So in such cases, although the coupling is antiferromagnetic, because the moment values are not the same, you will get a late magnetization. And such situations, such systems are called ferrimagnets. To sum up, these things, these magnetic orders, uh, except for Pauli paramagnets, they appear when you have magnetic moments in the system, and most cases these moments are due to electron spins. At least that's the dominant thing. What I'll now, uh, sorry, not the not the diamagnet. Paramagnet downward. So what I now want to understand is why is diamagnet different? I mean, why does it give you a negative susceptibility? Any idea, anybody, where it comes from? What is the origin of diamagnetic response of um, any system? Sharon, any idea? Uh, is it because lens law? No, that uh, I didn't understand. Lens law, what, what is it? Uh, no, I actually don't know, but uh, 
uh, in uh, in atoms we see that if we uh, give a magnetic field uh, uh, if we if we consider the electron to be classical then uh, its speed changes in a way that it's uh, that it uh, opposes that magnetic field so are you trying to say that it's the um, so my question is uh, let me make it more pointed that uh, are you uh, talking about the orbital uh, motion of the electrons or are you talking of the spin degrees of freedom of the electron orbital motion yeah that's right so uh, diamagnetism is related to the orbital motion of electrons and for that you don't need to uh, consider the electrons classically even in a quantum treatment um, we'll see that um, diamagnetism arises when the only thing you have to consider is the orbital motion of the of the electrons so let us see so suppose i have i have electrons in atoms and it could be a single atom it could be atoms in solids whatever and then i apply an electric uh, external magnetic field so the sort of hamiltonian so i have uh, okay so the hamiltonian is if i have a number of electrons plus i have uh, potential terms due to electron 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 nuclear interactions blah, blah. so uh, let's not worry about that now from here i'll get two different kinds of terms and and so okay so one is talking about we are interested in um, let's say we are talking about a constant magnetic field along partic some particular direction so uh, i'll take a as So this will give me a constant magnetic field. Uh, I could take H along the z direction. So this will give me two terms. So this part, uh, one is of course the p squared term, which is just the you know, usual kinetic energy. The other term, you'll get a p dot a kind of terms, which will give you. the coupling of the orbital moment to the magnetic field i mean i expect you have done these things in some other course like the atomic physics or something so you should try to work it out if you haven't done it if you have done it then it's perfect so p can be written as del operator and so when you take the so one is the del square the other thing is p dot a but because they don't commute you have p dot a and then a dot p so you have to treat those terms carefully so that will give you the coupling of the orbital moment to the external magnetic field and uh, finally you have the a squared term coming from here for weak fields in general so when you have a magnet uh, when you have an orbital moment and when you have spin spin of course does not appear in this hamiltonian because this non relativistic hamiltonian and, and there is no spin involved in this but we know that there is a spin degree of freedom so we can just put it by hand so uh, i can write uh, so i can write this hamiltonian as h which has 
um, the sort of kinetic part, the usual p squared part, plus um, the field part, and part uh, plus the potential part, which is this. Now, this field part from here will give me two terms. One is L dot H kind of term. The other is A squared term, the H squared term. And on top of that, I put the S term, the S dot H, the, the spin moment uh, inter uh, coupling with the external field by hand. So putting that by hand, I will get, um, these are the two terms that will appear. BL plus two, two is the gyromagnetic ratio for spins. So I'll get this. This is the field part of the Hamiltonian plus, I'm not looking at the potential or the kinetic part, plus this A squared term. Now uh, you can evaluate it in an elaborate manner. It's not necessary. You can see that, uh, let's see, if I take, the uh, magnetic field along the z direction, then r cross h has to be in the xy plane. There's a factor of two here. So square would give me a factor of four. There is a two here, so I get a factor of eight. So I should get um, p squared over eight in c squared h squared, and then I should get um, r square in the xy plane, which would be x squared plus y squared. And since I have, in general, many electrons, uh, so this should be sum over all the electrons. So that is the full Hamiltonian. When I have these things, when, th when these are non-zero, we typically ignore this term because the effect of this is far greater. So to lowest order, we take the order H terms and neglect this. In fact, all this earlier analysis, although that's mostly done in a sort of classical language, but if you do the quantum treatment, I mean, at least in the, in the when you got the Brillouin function and so on. So the coupling was considered to be between this and this, this and this, okay? Um, so this eight square terms were never considered. But suppose you have a situation, and, and there are ways how you treat this. I, I, I assume you have done these things. You can do LS coupling, JJ coupling, depending on whatever atom you have. That's not my concern. The concern is that suppose I have a situation Suppose I have a situation where, you know, it's field shell, all the shells are fixed. So in that, that case, um, the L and S are all zero. So then the, the first term that you are left with is this. So that is the dominant effect. And the task is to calculate the susceptibility uh, for this. Okay, so right. Just a minute. Okay. Um, right. So uh, what we're doing, so, so this is part of the Hamiltonian. So the energy in this case would go like um, 
because of the field part. So this is the expectation value of this quant of this operator. in the state which is the uh, you know field shell so let me indicate this by so this is a state so fs is a state which is a field shell state in which l and s are both zero so what was my chi so ultimately i want to calculate chi chi was del m del h and what is m this is something i never sort of specified but this is derivative of free energy with respect to the field ah sorry this is m so so chi is this so chi in other words is del 2f del h So it's obvious that you will have a negative number. So chi. Now, if I use this idea here, the h square goes, and chi will turn out to be e squared, eight m c squared. Expectation value of x i squared plus y i squared, and I can assume that the field shell is spherically symmetric. So expectation value of x squared plus y squared is going to be 2 thirds expectation value of r squared so that gives me um 2 thirds field shell r squared so that's it and okay it depends on how many electrons you have in the field shell so that's the negative point there so it's the orbital motions uh because this simply comes from the orbital motion of the electrons so when when there are field shell when there are no orbital or spin moments to couple to the external field the dominant contribution will come from this orbital motion of the electrons and they will sort of try to readjust in a way that they shield the external magnetic field that's exactly uh what sun was trying to say that the idea is absolutely correct so the diamagnetism comes from orbital motion of electrons that try to shield the external magnetic field okay so we have learned about these various magnetic orders and responses of materials and um that's all for today's lecture you can ask if you have any questions Uh, sir at yes uh, i mean uh, if we consider sufficiently high magnetic field then uh, should not like i mean 